And hello and welcome along. It's Kathy Frey here from IMCO from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome along today to our return of Dr. Noah Zaki. Noah, say hello. Hello. <laughs> and uh, she is in Egypt. So um, we're working with some interesting time zones on this live session. And um, yeah. yeah. Noah is going to introduce herself, and um, we've got a really important and interesting topic here today, which is this attachment informed pregnancy after loss. And we have had quite a bit of conversation on this around that topic of rainbow babies. And but you know, the the more we know, the better, the more we can help, right? So um, Noah's going to go through that, but she's an assistant professor of psychology at the American um, University in Cairo um, and teaches both um, at the undergraduate and graduate level. And her research interests mostly focus on lifespan development, specifically the effects of childhood attachment on adult development. Um, and she's particularly interested in maternal mental health um, attachment styles and that whole transition to parenthood. So the plan today is that Noor's going to take over the screen. She's got a um, PowerPoint, a beautiful PowerPoint that she's going to go through. And uh, But don't hesitate if you have any questions um, that you can go in live and um, just go and down the bottom to the Q and A box, and just type in any questions that you have. Um, otherwise, we'll conclude things um, in about three quarters of an hour time with um, a little bit of a chin wag, a little chat, and yeah. So I'm going to hand over to Noor. Hello, thank you so much, Katie, for this amazing introduction. Uh, and good evening, good morning, depending on where you are, if you're watching this live or if you're watching it as a recorded webinar later on. Uh, I'm from Cairo, Egypt, so it's, so it's 11 p.m. here now, and I have to drink a lot of coffee to be able to be wide awake at this hour to give this webinar, but I'm really happy uh, that you're hosting me again, Katie. This is our second uh, live webinar. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very happy with the kind of knowledge you're spreading and the awareness that you uh, are advocating for. So thank you very much for that. So you already mentioned many things regarding my background in your introduction, um, but I'll add to that, that one of the areas I'm really passionate about is perinatal psychology. And I work with a lot of couples uh, in the stages before pregnancy, during pregnancy and after birth, which is directly related to our topic today. Let me start sharing you can see my screen right okay so even though we might be from very different parts of the world i think my talk today will speak to many people uh, because it is an experience that is universal in many aspects of it, but also very personal and very subjective. And we want to acknowledge both of these aspects of it. Uh, and I want to set the intention for this webinar, for this kind of knowledge and awareness to reach many people who may be going through such an experience and through um, such feelings of loss and grief, and also the healthcare practitioners who may be working with the women and the couples undergoing this experience, or even family members who would want to support or know what to say better. So unfortunately, this is a topic that's very highly overlooked. We're talking about getting pregnant again and having an attachment informed pregnancy after experiencing a loss, a pregnancy loss, which is quite a challenging topic to talk about and to be able to cover it in a comprehensive yet a brief way in our webinar today. Uh, but I think it's very important to talk about it because even in the literature, it's not really addressed a lot. And not many people have the chance to actually talk about what they're going through and the emotions, the very complicated emotions that they may be uh, feeling throughout that time. And it is actually a traumatic experience for a lot of couples around the world. So I hope that with this webinar today, we're able to shed light on some of these experiences and also the cultural reactions that we have and what kind of things we might be saying, but may not be very helpful and what better suggestions may be there and also some tips uh, with regards to that topic. So this is my plan for today's talk, which again is going to be 
relatively brief in comparison to what this topic really needs in order for us to cover it comprehensively. But I want to talk, uh, first of all, about the different types of pregnancy loss that um, a woman may go through in terms of the definitions, the official definitions for each of these pregnancy uh, loss, and also the prevalence, the worldwide prevalence for each of these. And then I want to go into what kind of impact does a pregnancy loss have uh, particularly from an emotional and psychological perspective. We may know some of the biological, physical implications of that, and it's talked a lot about in the literature, but we don't address the emotional, psychological aspect a lot. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the possible issues with the, with the future pregnancies, with the subsequent pregnancies, and then end uh, with some tips regarding having an attachment-informed pregnancy after a loss. So let me start right away with the different types of pregnancy loss. And I'm going to address four different ones. Um, this is not fully comprehensive of all types of losses, of course, but these are the most ones that are addressed in the literature and the research and uh, in clinical practices as well. So I'm going to talk about miscarriage, stillbirth, twin loss, and pregnancy termination. Let me start with a miscarriage. A miscarriage is generally defined as an unintended termination of the pregnancy, which usually happens prior to 20 weeks of gestation. And it's the most common type of pregnancy loss that women experience, usually in their first trimester. The overall prevalence of miscarriages is from 15 to 27%. And here we're talking about the age bracket between 25 and 29 years of age. But when the woman is older than 45 years old, this percentage goes up to 75%, which is relatively very high. There's also an elevated risk for women who have experienced a previous miscarriage um, to experience another one in the future. And in terms of worldwide numbers regarding miscarriages, what's reported is 23 million miscarriages around the world annually which is a big number. The second type of pregnancy loss that I'll address today is stillbirth, which is the death of a fetus after 20 weeks gestation with a birth weight of over 500 grams. And in these cases, the fetus usually has either died during the pregnancy or during labor, um, which happens often unexpectedly and sometimes after a completely uncomplicated pregnancy. The annual frequency for stillbirths is about 2.6 million uh, stillbirths worldwide. As for twin losses, which are the third type of pregnancy loss that I'm talking about, uh, usually in pregnancy of multiples, whether twins, triplets, quadruplets, there is an elevated risk of perinatal and neonatal mortality, which leads to a considerable uh, proportion of twins experiencing a very early loss of their co-twin. And actually, this week I was teaching in my lifespan development course a very interesting article that talks about the fact that when a woman loses one of the twins in utero, researchers can see in ultrasound that there is a dark spot that usually uh, takes the place of that baby, and the other baby, the other sibling or the other twin, has a very interesting way of respecting and acknowledging the presence or the place of the baby that used to be there by not going in the place of that dark spot. It's a very interesting article. Um, and then the fourth type of pregnancy loss that can happen is a pregnancy termination. And there are many types for that. One of the most common ones that are mentioned uh, a lot in the literature and in clinical practices is the therapeutic termination of pregnancy which is an induced abortion performed. Um, it may be performed for medical reasons, such as avoiding the risk for any kind of substantial harm to the mother or in cases of lethal abnormalities of the fetus. So these are the four different types of pregnancy losses that I'm referring to when we're talking about this topic today. This leads me to the second point. What kind of impact does any of these pregnancy losses have on, um, on the mother in terms of psychological and emotional impact. And I'll start with the mother because this is what we usually think about and what the literature refers to a lot. But I also want to shed light on the impact um, 
that is also placed on the father or the partner in the relationship and the impact on the couple's relationship as well. Because I think these are points that are very rarely talked about. And I do see with the couples I work with that it's very important to address what's also happening with the partner and what's happening in the dynamic of the couple's relationship as well. But let's start to talk about the mother first, the person who was carrying the baby, biologically carrying the baby. So it's a biological loss and also an emotional and psychological one. Um, I want to say that there are different levels of prenatal bonding. When we talk about maternal infant uh, attachment, there are several stages in which this can happen. The way the mother would bond with the fetus, this would take several stages, several um, in a sequence, like several levels. It would start with planning the pregnancy. Sometimes women would start to bond with the fetus. That's just with the idea that they're planning to have a baby. The second one, when the pregnancy is confirmed. Third is when the pregnancy is accepted. Fourth, when the baby starts to move. Fifth, when the woman accepts the fetus as an individual. Sixth is during birth. Seven, once she sees the baby. Eight, when she touches the baby. Nine, when she starts to take care of the baby. So I mentioned nine steps that the mother would go through, starting from the baby just being an idea in her mind, just planning for the pregnancy until the baby is right there, touching the baby, holding the baby in her arms, and providing care for that baby. And that means that the bonding that happens between the mom and her baby starts very early on for many mothers. Um, the level and the intensity of bonding would differ, and it's a very subjective experience. But many mothers, when they experience a pregnancy loss, would have already went through several of these stages and have already created a strong bond and a strong connection with that baby already. And the degree of bonding increases with each of these events. So the loss, now going back to what the loss means for the mom, the loss actually entails so many things that are happening. And it's not just the, an event that's happening in the present moment, or in the near past for someone who has experienced the loss in the past few months, for example. But it's also a loss that entails a future that would have happened, a future that would have taken place with that baby. So it's the loss of future hopes and dreams. It's the loss of the anticipated parent role. It's the loss of a, an anticipated identity that the mother was waiting for and was preparing for on many levels. It's the loss of being pregnant, loss of prenatal medical attention, loss of self-esteem for many women. And it's also the concern over the potential loss of her ability to create a new life. So it's a loss that has so many different angles to it uh, that we need to take into consideration. However, this loss sometimes and it's very unfortunate that I have to say that oftentimes this is what happens. The woman does not feel that this loss is seen enough. It's not heard. It's not acknowledged or validated by those around her or um, sometimes e even the healthcare professionals in certain communities. If this is not seen, it can lead to a very high prevalence of complicated grief reactions because the woman is not allowed enough. Her emotions are not validated enough and therefore the impact is much higher. This can definitely affect her mental health in terms of elevated rates of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress reactions for some women. And also the impact may be prolonged. And it's not an event, as I started by saying, it's not an event that's happening in the present and the loss is just experienced in the present moment. It's experienced in so many dimensions because the prolonged period of time of grief entails that she will experience it again when she gets pregnant again, if she gets pregnant again. She will experience it when the due date comes. That was supposed to be a birthday for the baby, but is not happening in that way. She might experience it again in would-be milestones, certain periods of time when that baby would have reached a particular milestone. But again, this is not happening. So there are so many things. Uh, that are happening and it prolongs the grief reaction, particularly if it's unresolved and it's not uh, dealt with in a healthy way. And I want to really highlight the fact that this is a grief experience. The fact that this is a loss, not only a biological loss, but also emotional and psychological means that it is a grief process that the mother is going through. 
And this painful grief can include so many emotions that are very commonly reported by the moment. It includes guilt, anger, distress, intrusive thoughts, shame, low self-esteem, so many emotions and experiences that the woman may be going through. And again, this may be very different from one person to another in terms of the type of emotion and also the intensity of emotion. Uh, one more thing that I want to say about the impact on the mom, and this is something that I hear quite commonly from uh, different women, that they dislike the word miscarriage. We use it a lot, but many women who go through this experience don't like the term miscarriage because it actually carries a connotation that the woman was not able to carry the baby in her uterus to full term. And they prefer the term missed pregnancy or missed baby instead. Now, moving on to the impact on the father or the partner in that case. And again, I really want to shed light on, on that part as well, because it's very often overlooked. Fathers and partners also develop prenatal attachment to their infants and the baby. And that means that there is also a considerable psychological effect and there is a grief reaction that's happening as well with the partner. Grief reactions may be different and may be expressed very differently though. And this is what we need to understand in a deeper way. Men, the research shows that men tend to grieve less intensely and for shorter periods of time than their partners in that case. However, the symptoms of grieving may be very similar. There are some differences with the, the grief experience though, including men reporting less crying and feeling a lower need to talk about what they're going through, as opposed to how the woman uh, may be feeling this grief and may be expressing it. Men also have a tendency to internalize the experience um, and not really talk about it, as I mentioned, not share how they feel, and also attempt to distract themselves from really sitting with these painful emotions uh, and speaking about it. There's obviously also a societal pressure and certain types of expectations, just like we have with other types of grief and losses, but in this case, particularly with related to pregnancy losses, a societal pressure on the partner to take care of the mother who was pregnant, of the woman, and to leave aside and put aside what he is going through so that he doesn't add to her pain and that he doesn't trigger it and he doesn't uh, make the experience more complicated for her. And by doing that, by taking care of the mother, sometimes the partner may have to um, repress his own um, emotions, his own grief reactions. And it can be a very challenging experience to have to provide support for a grieving partner while also having to cope with one's own grief. So that needs to be understood within that psychological uh, understanding. Now, after talking about the impact on the mother and the partner, it's also important to um, think about how does that have an impact on the couple's relationship. So grieving parents tend to look towards one another for comfort immediately after the death of the baby. They turn towards each other for comfort, for support, and both of them are going through a process, a grief process. But each one of them may have a very different grieving style. And when we talk about grief, I want to remind you that we have five stages of grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about the five stages of grief, starting from denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. And people don't have to go through, through these different stages in, a, in the same sequence that I mentioned, um, but sometimes they experience it very differently. And again, with different intensities. But one partner may be going through a very sad phase of crying and feeling their emotions and wanting to talk about it while the other partner is in denial, is, in, is still in denial at least, doesn't want to talk about it at all and doesn't want to address the emotions that come with this experience. For the partner who is really sad and feeling their emotions, it might feel like the other partner is not on the same page. They don't feel the same emotions. They don't feel how big of an impact it has on them. While that might not be very accurate, it's just their grieving style in that particular moment. And also, on the other hand, the partner who is in denial may be very triggered by seeing the intense emotions that the other one is showing. So they may be triggering each other with their different grieving styles, which often leads to conflict. 
and feeling like they're not on the same page or there's a gap between them or they don't understand each other very, very well. And it's already a stressful time, obviously, so that leads to more conflict. One of the, um, one of the ways that I've heard someone talk about this was saying, we're like two trains going in the same direction, but apart. So we're going through the same experience of this grief and this loss, but it's, it feels like we're going in parallel ways. We don't meet halfway. There is no common ground. Each one of us is feeling this in a very different way. Another commonly reported uh, dynamic that happens is when the woman feels like she has failed her partner by having the miscarriage or the pregnancy loss. But I also want to say that for some couples, the experience may bring them together, may bring them closer together. And that usually happens when they're able to open up and be vulnerable with each other and share their emotional experience and in, in a genuine and, and vulnerable way. And they're able to do that while still feeling safe. Before I end this part about the impact of the pregnancy loss, I want to mention that cultural attitudes related to prenatal loss are very important to, again, acknowledge and understand, because as a community, this is our role to be able to support these individuals, not just in the capacity of being healthcare providers or therapists or in whatever capacity you're doing that, but also as family members and friends who are around many, many couples who are going through such experiences. So in some communities around the world, miscarriage and stillbirth are actually perceived to uh, stem from bad omens, witchcraft, or immorality. And women who experience repeated losses are frequently reported to be shunned, to be stigmatized, to even be abandoned by their family members and partners. This still happens until this day and age in many parts of the world. This might not be the case in your, in your community or in other parts of the world, but still the cultural attitudes of invalidating what the, the grieving parents are going through are very, very common. And it does contribute a lot to prolonged and intense negative emotions that the grieving parents will, will have for a long period of time. Some of the things that we commonly say or hear people saying to grieving parents are things like, maybe the time wasn't right. Good thing it happened now before it was a real baby and then you were really attached to the baby, which actually makes the grieving parents feel like they're completely misunderstood, invalidated. Uh, their experiences are dismissed and minimized in many ways. Uh, sometimes people say, at least you know you can get pregnant or the very common advice, try to have another baby right away, which again, are not or may not be what the grieving parents need to hear. So. I thought of adding this slide of some do's and don'ts in case you want to know how to support someone who experienced a miscarriage or experienced pregnancy loss, any of the types that we mentioned. So the do's, I'll start with the do's. It's very important to acknowledge the loss, to acknowledge that it is a grief experience, to listen to the grieving parents and let them grieve in the way that they in whatever way they're doing that, basically, there is no particular framework. They don't need to go through stages and steps in a certain sequence or within a certain frame. Encourage them to talk if they want to and if they're ready to talk about it. Recognize that grief does not have a time limit. There is no stopwatch that we have for that. And you know, you need to grieve for a certain period of time and then you know you need to get over it or go get back to uh, your daily life and, and that kind of thing. It really is, again, a grieving experience that's very subjective from one person to another. It's also important to ask how you can help and to offer practical support. Um, help end the silence around miscarriage by being willing to talk about it because sometimes we avoid the talk the topic altogether and it keeps uh feeding this loop of the stigma or the um, the 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 idea of just being silent about it and not talking about it also reassure them that it was not their fault particularly the woman who was pregnant who in many many cases would feel that sense of blame directly or indirectly that it was her fault reassure them that they're not alone check in when you can. And if you make a mistake or say something that was not very um, spot on for whatever reason, 
apologize for that and let the person know that you that this is coming from good intentions that you really want to help but sometimes you, you're not sure how to do that you don't know what's the right thing to say and that's okay to kind of acknowledge that because in many cases particularly in situations of grief we actually don't know what's the right thing to say we want to make the other person feel good we want to take the pain away we want to make them feel better so we say things that are coming out of good intentions but may not be what the other person needs which brings me to the last point here. If you're unsure what to say, ask the grieving parent what would be most helpful for them right now. And if that includes just staying silent, that's okay. If it's um, a need to distract them from what they're going through, that's okay. Whatever it is that they need, basically, and then you're better able to do that. And then some of the don'ts. Don't use the cliche comments like it happened for a reason or you can always try again. Don't blame, don't offer unsolicited advice. Uh, don't rush their grieving process, don't avoid them or talking about, don't avoid talking about uh, the, the topic again. Don't push them to talk if they're not ready. Don't make assumptions. Don't invalidate and minimize the emotions that they're going through. Uh, particularly the one that I hear a lot is, uh, but you haven't seen the baby yet, but you, you didn't have time to be attached to the baby yet. So it's, it's enough for the grieving parents to be going through that amount of pain we shouldn't add to it by minimizing it and invalidating it. Also, don't tell them how to do things differently in the next pregnancy and don't take their reactions personally. Now, moving on to the third part uh, of my talk, now that we understand the kind of impact this can have on the mom, on the partner, and on the couple's relationship. Now, what possible issues can arise with subsequent pregnancies? Um, first of all, I mentioned the grief, the grief um, cycle, the grief responses that people have, the five stages of grief. When people don't go through that process and they don't take their time to actually feel their emotions, even though they're very painful, and it's very tempting to try and distract oneself from these uh, very painful emotions. But when we, go, when we don't go through it, when we go around it, it becomes unresolved and it becomes very easily triggered, particularly if um, uh, the couple decides to get pregnant again. This is very common, especially if the woman gets pregnant right after the miscarriage or the pregnancy loss, and she does not give herself enough time to process uh, her grief reaction. And research shows actually that one of the things that helps with um, grief responses being less intense is being able to identify an exact medical reason why the miscarriage happened, for example. So if it was a fetal chromosomal abnormality and the woman knows for a fact that there is nothing, there is no blame whatsoever that is put on her, this does help with uh, reducing the intensity of grieving uh, and feeling less blame and personal responsibility for the pregnancy loss. However, it's not significant in terms of decreasing the concern over future pregnancies. It's still a concern. The second possible issue that can happen is all the mental health elements that can arise with regards to pregnancy-related symptoms. That can inc include perinatal depression or anxiety in the coming pregnancies. So this can include feelings of sadness, low mood, excessive anxiety, uh, also hypervigilance regarding physical symptoms that the mother uh, is feeling. This can lead to baby overstimulation. It can lead to many more physical exams that the mother feels the need to have to make sure that everything is going fine. It can lead to delaying um, communicating with other people that she's pregnant or even resistance to preparation for the baby's arrival in case it does not happen. Um, also, there is usually a decreased sense of security in subsequent pregnancies. Um, and this may be related to the woman's low level of self-esteem and her own feelings of um, lower self-efficacy, basically, that maybe she can't do it. Maybe she can't carry this baby. Maybe there is something wrong with her. All these sorts of questions and doubts that may arise. The third possible issue is 
becoming very ambivalent regarding the coming pregnancy. And this is very commonly referred to as the one foot in, one foot out concept. And this means that the mother may be very looking forward to the coming pregnancy, very excited for meeting her baby. But at the same time, she doesn't want to be too invested in this pregnancy. And she's trying to kind of um, have take take precautions basically being very cautious around the whole pregnancy so that if it doesn't happen she's she doesn't feel the same um levels of pain and and grief and the way the woman talks about her pregnancy she would say things like if the baby is born instead of saying when the baby is born and you can see the ambivalence you can see the um, one foot in, one foot out. Like I'm talking about the baby, but I'm using if instead of one. Emotional detachment is another big one. And it's very, very common for women who experience a pregnancy loss to use a defense mechanism or a coping style in her next pregnancy of being emotionally detached. It's very obvious the reason why someone would do that, even though for, for the woman herself, it may not be that conscious. She may not really understand what's happening and she may blame herself for it and feel guilty for it. But at the same time, she may have different kinds of attempts to limit her bonding or not bond at all, even with the baby, to protect herself from a new potential loss. So that would lead to lower prenatal attachment to the baby. This includes things like trying not to think too deeply about the future, trying not to think about the future at all, until it happens, until she carries the baby in her arms. So she protects herself by compartmentalizing the pregnancy, like putting it on a shelf in her mind and not being too invested emotionally. This is called emotional cushioning. And by doing that, she's not truly acknowledging her depth of feeling, but also protecting herself from feeling a very high level of pain if things don't go as planned. Um, Guard, having guarded emotions, using avoidance behaviors, holding back emotions, resisting to prepare for the, for the coming of the baby, whether physically, emotionally, or socially. And another common one that often we don't talk about very much is the woman feeling like if she bonds with the baby, if she connects with the baby, from the current pregnancy, that means that she's kind of betraying or abandoning her lost baby. This may be on a very unconscious level. She may not know this on any conscious level in terms of her daily thoughts and daily behaviors, but sometimes it drives a lot of what the woman is doing or not doing in her subsequent pregnancy. And then I want to talk about two very interesting concepts that can also result in subsequent pregnancies, the replacement child syndrome and the vulnerable child syndrome. The replacement child is when we see parents using another pregnancy or a subsequent child as a substitution for the child they have lost. And by doing that, sometimes they do that right away. They would try to have another baby right away to, to replace the baby who was lost or substitute that baby in a way. Or it can happen after some period of time, but still the grief response was not resolved appropriately. And in that case, the grieving parents have unrealistic expectations of the infant. This infant comes to the world with a very high burden and a very high responsibility to replace the child who was lost. And they do that because there's a fear of forgetting the previous, um, the previous um, lost baby. So they have very unrealistic expectations of this coming child that they're going to basically live the life that the lost child was supposed to have. Sometimes they even give the child the name that was given for the baby who was lost. And this adds a whole layer of complicated dynamic with the child and of treating the child as if they're a child who they're not, if that makes sense. So this is the idea of having a replacement child. The other concept is having a vulnerable child, the vulnerable child syndrome. This is another distortion of maternal or parental perception of the child that leads to very high overprotection. They treat the child as if they're made of glass. They're going to break 
if anything happens to them. And they become overprotective. They try to micromanage the child's life in so many ways, and they have very high difficulty separating and individuating from that child. And this is because they fear losing this child just like they have lost a previous child. So these two concepts are very powerful when we understand them and when we're able to acknowledge the kind of impact that this dynamic would have on the new parent-child relationship. When we understand that early on or even after it happened, it helps a lot with reshaping the dynamic with the child. That leads me to the last part of today's talk, which is related to the tips um, for a mindful pregnancy after a loss. The, the title of today's webinar, I think by now we have built some basic foundation of the importance of acknowledging the impact of this experience, what kind of impact it has on the grieving parents, uh, what it can cause in terms of the effect on subsequent pregnancies. And now, if a woman is pregnant after a loss, how she can still be mindful with regards to her pregnancy in an attachment-informed way. All the tips that I'll mention now are based on two very important concepts. She needs to acknowledge the grief and honor the grief and also be mindful of her current experience. Striking this balance can take some time and it can be challenging, very challenging even for some parents. Um, but the more aware we become of this process, the more helpful it becomes in terms of creating an attachment informed, mindful, conscious pregnancy. So first of all, acknowledge and honor your grief. It's important to allow yourself to grieve the loss of your previous pregnancy recognize that anything that you're going through is normal and it's your own experience. It does not have to adhere by certain standards or guidelines of how things should be and how long it should take. This is your experience and anything that you're going through is valid and understandable and you're entitled to that. No one can take that away from you. Um, and it's also important to take the time to process everything that you're feeling and to seek support from loved ones. Cultivating self-compassion is another big one. I see a lot of women being very, very harsh on themselves by putting a lot of blame, a lot of responsibility, a lot of shame even um, after experiencing such a loss. So having that sense of kindness and self-compassion goes a long way actually. And practicing self-care is a big part of that. So recognizing that your experiences are valid, as we mentioned, Engaging in activities that bring you joy and help you relax, like exercise, mindfulness, journaling, spending time in nature, whatever helps you connect more with yourself and your emotions while still being kind to yourself throughout that process. The third tip is to communicate openly with your partner. We talked about the impact this can have in terms of the couple's relationship and it can actually take a huge toll on a relationship if the partners are not open with each other regarding how they feel, where they are in that process, how they feel about getting pregnant again, sharing their thoughts, their fears, their hopes. Being able to do that in an open, transparent, honest communication ensures that both partners are on the same page, especially if um, there's a subsequent pregnancy. And then building a support network. It's very important. And it helps a lot when the grieving parents feel like they're not alone in that experience. And by building a support network, I mean connecting with other people who have um, experienced a similar loss or who have gone through a similar experience. And that can happen through support groups, for example. This can be a face-to-face -face support groups if these exist in your community or even online support groups if, if it's not very easy to meet with others who are undergoing um, a similar experience. Establishing a nurturing environment by creating uh, a supportive environment for yourself and your baby and surrounding yourself with positive influences in general. So give your baby a name, document your pregnancy, take pictures, 
um, journal about your emotions and how you feel, read to your baby, communicate with your baby, sing to your baby, all these different types of activities that you can do on your own or with your baby can really create a nurturing environment that can give um, a much needed um, relaxed atmosphere throughout this pregnancy. And practicing mindfulness and relaxation techniques can also be very helpful for many people to manage anxiety and stress during pregnancy. So deep breathing, meditation, guided imagery, prenatal yoga, they can promote a sense of uh, calmness and connection with the baby. And then the last couple of tips actually uh, are kind of related to each other. So seeking attachment informed prenatal care so working with healthcare providers who understand the importance of attachment in prenatal care, um, they can definitely help by offering guidance on promoting attachment, bonding activities and strategies to address any anxieties or concerns. And if the, the grief process that I mentioned in this talk is very heavy on you or you feel like you cannot do this on your own, it's perfectly fine to also seek professional guidance um, uh, with mental health professionals who are uh, ideally specialized in uh, perinatal psychology so that they can help with the experience that you're going through and to give you the guidance and support that you need and also to provide a containing environment just to hold the space for you to go through what you're going through in a healthy way. So these are my tips for having a mindful pregnancy after loss. Before I end and we take questions, if there are any, I want to acknowledge uh, my research assistant, Mariam Abdraouf, who did an amazing job uh, researching this topic with me and preparing a lot of the content that is uh, included in this webinar. Uh, and I also want to thank women who share their experiences and their vulnerability and who trust me and other uh, professionals in the field with such personal experiences, very painful um, experiences that they're going through. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping that this webinar, again, with anyone who's attending now live or who's watching this at any point in the future, I hope that this speaks to you or gives information that is valuable in terms of support. Um, and just by shedding light on a topic that we don't talk about often, but it's very much needed to open a discussion around. Feel free to reach out with any questions. This is my email and this is my Instagram page. Uh, I'm not big on social media, but I'm trying to create a professional page. So let's see how that goes. And I'll come back to you, Katie, if you have any questions. It's just fantastic. I think we're good on time. Well, yeah, it was really just wonderful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's... It's such a tricky thing, isn't it? Because I think that, um, well, from my experience anyway, as a as a midwife, um, and as a sort of general maternity advisor, we the, it's it's hard for the birth practitioners themselves, I think, to not get a little bit emotionally detached from mm. it is it's in in that miscarriages and particularly the first trimester miscarriages because they're very yeah. common um yes and it, it is a very different thing you know dealing with a woman who's lost a baby at eight months pregnant you know that's a whole different ball game mm. um absolutely uh, you know but but with the those first trimester pregnancies especially the ones that are very early you know so there might only be mm -hmm. five or six or seven or eight weeks um mm -hmm. sometimes what i've found is helpful for the woman um because a lot of the times when we have anything kind of negative medically occur to us it's usually mm -hmm. a giant learning curve right and oh no I've yeah. got this and then suddenly you learn about all these other people that have that and and mm. you know it's it, so oftentimes with a woman miscarrying this is just all new new to her you know of course Absolutely. she just hasn't been yeah. around it she hasn't got much information on it and mm. 
I have found that it's um uh it's can seem to be helpful to just give women the facts on human reproduction. So yeah. um, you know, explaining that um when an when eggs fertilize, you know, 70% of fertilized eggs never implant. And yeah. of those yeah. that that of that 30% that implant, one third of them naturally miscarry. So mm. it's only two of ten fertilized eggs or one in five that actually converts into establishing as a successful pregnancy. Mm. Um and so sometimes when people, when we're women hear that, they kind of go, oh, you know, they they feel like there's less wrong with them. Exactly. Right? Yeah. When, you know, when it's one in five fertilized eggs that converts into a successfully established pregnancy, well, you know, it's not about them. It's just a normal statistic. Uh, yeah. I to normalize yeah. things. And, um, uh, and also, and um, and I don't mean this condescendingly, and I think it has to be careful how it's delivered so it doesn't feel condescending. But mm. you know, the great majority of babies that are born are healthy and completely normal, and mm. it's kind of miraculous that they are because there's so many things that have to go right. <laughs> yeah for yeah. a healthy normal baby to occur like so many things yes. that have to go yeah. right so it is miraculous and and I'll often sort of have, I've heard myself sort of saying you know we've we don't understand we don't always understand why you know this this six-week embryo didn't continue mm. but we mm. have to be grateful for to mother nature because She's wise and she knows. And that's why we have so many healthy, normal babies. Yeah. Because she yeah. makes the decision very early and goes, all night. Yeah. Nothing's wrong with that. And I will say to woman, now, if you're having two or three miscarriages in a row, that's not normal. Mm. And mm. um and that's where preconception health care for you and for your partner you know it, miscarriages mm. occur because of poor quality sperm as much as mm. they occur as suboptimal eggs so mm. um just yeah so kind of i i guess what i'm saying is trying to normalize those first yeah trimester. that's true you know, like I've had women who've said, oh, I've had two healthy pregnancies before and why has this third one miscarried? Well, one mm. of three miscarry. Mm. So you're statistically average. Yeah. Um, I but, deliver you know, that in a nicer way. By saying, yeah. <laughs> right? But, it, yeah. yeah, deliver it in a nicer way. But but give, I find that giving women the knowledge that it... it it sort of takes the blame off them and makes it well, that's true mother nature this is human reproduction yeah. this is what happens yeah. um yeah and yeah but as I say very different when it's a oh you know uh, late seconds and third trimester still births really rather you know once we get into that yeah, it's like very, yeah. That's, a, that's a whole different yeah um but you know, Katie, as you started by saying, it's very tricky because when you're supporting women and couples who are going through this experience, you want to normalize it. You want to give the facts. You want to say one in five uh, will not implant actually in the uterine wall and would end in uh, like the, the fertilization would not be complete and the pregnancy will not happen or a miscarriage will happen later on. And it's very common in the first trimesters. But you know, it's also interesting how when we hear statistics we usually don't consider ourselves to be part of that you know we don't consider these in that sense you hear one in five and you go but I'm from the four who are going to yes. go right and then it's still a shock yeah. if you're if you're one in five it's still a shock it's it's not just because you know the facts 
sometimes it doesn't make it any easier because it's still a very deeply emotional experience that the person is going through. So it's very tricky, you know, trying to have that balance between giving the facts, giving the information, but also really respecting how the person is responding to that. And people have very different reactions and with very different intensities. And sometimes it doesn't happen right away, but, you know, it may strike later on for any reason and it gets re-triggered. So, and, it, and, it and actually... Was, that huge impact as well about how long they've been trying for this pregnancy. Exactly. You know, I mean, for, how I much mean, they how, wanted it. Yeah, how much yeah. they wanted it because you've got some women yeah. who are actually just grateful they miscarried. Yes, um, yes. And, yeah, then you've got ones that was, oh, my God, we never expected this pregnancy. But particularly... Yes. And by know, the way, sorry for interrupting you, but you're yeah. saying a very important point here. That's also fine. I mean, if the woman or the couple feel relief, if they feel really relieved because this happened or they feel better that it ended that way because they it was unplanned to start with, uh, with and it was mistimed, for example, that's also okay. Like, it's their experience. It doesn't have to be intense or it doesn't have to take a certain pathway i mean normalizing whatever kind of reaction is happening is important and sometimes the tricky part is because it may happen very early on in the pregnancy sometimes the couple didn't even have the time to communicate that there that there is a baby yet so mm -hmm. how do you start communicating with other people around you suddenly that you're grieving and you're going through that pain and you have all these emotions when you didn't even say that you were pregnant to start yeah, it is. And there's that whole sort of thing around, um, you know, when is it safe to tell people? And I I've, I've can't imagine, you know, the, the times that I've had women ask me that question, when is it safe? Oh, you've um, frozen there, Noor. Okay, hopefully she'll come back on. Um, look, we're almost getting to time. And... Um, if anybody has any questions, do type them into the Q&A. Um, but otherwise, it looks like we might be needing to wind up because we've lost Noah. Such a fascinating subject, isn't it? You know, and it's um, it, it's very tricky, I think, for your health professionals in maternity. And, uh, oh, we've lost it completely. Yeah. Um, so, look, we got through. So that's really great. And... Um, I, I will wind it up, but look, thank you for those. Oh, she might be coming back. Oh, you're back, Noah. I'm here. I connected Fantastic. to my host. Okay. I'm okay. I'm not cool. sure what happened. No, you just <laughs> kind of froze and we lost you there, but we're, we're almost up to time. Um, But yeah. yeah, is there anything that you would like to um finish off with to conclude? Anything else you'd like to add? Um. I think just ending by the idea that we shouldn't make assumptions about people's experiences is very important. And one more thing, because I know that uh, some of the people watching this webinar may be uh, healthcare practitioners mm. uh, who may themselves have had pregnancy loss experiences when we're working in a field. And because I come from a psychology background, it's very important for us in that field to be aware of these personal experiences that may be triggering when we work with clients who are going through a similar experience that may mirror something that we have went through. Uh, that's also very important. I'd like to highlight that, uh, like inner work, if that's relevant, uh, in order to be able to be there for others, to hold a space that is containing um, and professional without making it about you, without being overly triggered, that kind of thing, that's also very important. What would so, be your kind of red flags? I get. I mean, it's a really valid point, and and you know, it's mostly women that are in these mm -hmm. roles as birth practitioners, particularly, um, mm -hmm. and we're dealing with women. So yeah, you know, a, a a lot of us have been all through those um journeys, and what would be? We'll wind it up in a moment, but what would be perhaps the red flags that, um, if you are a health professional and you you know, you are con concerned about that sort of triggering situation because mm. you've been through a similar uh, event yourself. What would be the red flags that you kind of would be looking out for that to know that you probably need to do a little bit more work in that area? Yeah. 
little bit so more. So some of the red flags usually that happen with any of these topics, like if something is personally triggering to you as a as a professional, you would feel like other than the fact that this is a painful experience that the person is talking about, but you would feel overly triggered, like you would be hypersensitive to the topic. Your body automatically reacts to it. Uh, it's not just that you're listening and you're trying to be there for the person, but maybe you have a lot of intrusive thoughts about your own experience, maybe some flashbacks, maybe um, it's it's triggering something in your body. Maybe you're trying to avoid the topic. You don't want the person to talk about it more. You're trying to distract them. You're trying to get them to talk about something else and divert it into something else because you don't want to talk about this. That's another one to look out for. Or you start to make it about yourself and you start to um, you know, become overly emotional yourself. And while it may be a good thing actually for the professional to be able to relate on some level, and sometimes when you say, I've been through a similar experience for some, that kind of disclosure, if it's, I mean, if it's the right place and time for it, it can actually be helpful. But I mean, it needs to stay on a certain level, being overly involved or feeling that you need to detach yourself from the situation. These are reflexes that I would say you need to look out for. And that may mean that you need to do some more work regarding your own experience to be able to be there for the person and to hold that space that is containing, but also professional and um, like supportive for the other person. Yeah. Thank you so much, Noor. We've had Thank a, you for having uh, me. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Oh. And um, we had a, an interesting little comment in um, from uh Watch as Shona, um, not a question, but a comment, a really helpful reminder about remaining curious and and to give time to explore yeah. that individual's experience. And a thank you to you. Um, thank you, Shona. Yeah. So look, we will we're at time, so we will wind this up. But thank you so much, Noor, for returning. And mm -hmm. you know, it is such a prevalent experience for women. Um, and it's just so one before before we went live, we were just um uh, joking about you know how psychology is a relatively new science hallelujah you know <laughs> finally yeah. finally yeah <laughs> 100 years ago it started to get recognized um yeah. but you know it's so much of um medicine uh you know for all the centuries has been so male focused and um it's it's wonderful that we you know we're getting there and what yeah. the, and where things will be by the time our grandbabies are having grandbabies will hopefully be just leaps and bounds ahead of where we are now for women as well i hope so and, and hope the whole so. motherhood journey yeah yeah so thank you again and thank you for those that were coming in live thank you and, and it was my pleasure that we'll have um uh, a lot of you will be watching this um, later down the track as well. So we just want to hear, and we just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of the day, rest of the week. And thank you so much, Noah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.